Guys, the new MacBooks are here and man, we have a lot to talk about. Let's ramble. Hold up, face go up when I pull up. They all on me like a one thing. Hey, what's up guys? It is great to see you all again. And if you're new here, I'm Patrick and this is where I ramble about tech and other stuff. So yesterday, the new MacBook Pros were presented among some other stuff, but who cares? These machines is what we've been waiting for. So let's dive right in. So we didn't get the M1X. Instead, we got two separate chips. One is called the Pro and the even more powerful one is called the Max or M1 Max. We'll get into what exactly that means in a little bit and also talk about the naming conventions for a bit. But let's just take a minute to talk about what actually happened here because the M1 was a big jump from the Intel machines. But here and there for Pro use, it's still a little bit lacking. So those of us who are on our MacBooks on a daily basis and we use it for heavier processes like video editing, we were still kind of holding out for that true Pro device. For me, this is also the reason why I stuck with my 16 inch Intel MacBook Pro and I skipped the M1 MacBook Pro. I did get an M1 Mac mini because a lot of people seemed over the moon with theirs and were showing how speedy their editing workflows had become on even the base model Mac mini. I had been meaning to get a dedicated desktop machine and this gave me an opportunity to get a taste of working with these new Apple Silicon chips. And I have to say, I was very impressed. For a Mac mini, which is pretty much the lowest end Mac you can get, this performed pretty great. In fact, in many ways, it outperformed my 16 inch MacBook Pro that I had specced out pretty much completely and which has cost me an arm and a leg. By the way, I'm a little salty about the fact that my 16 inch MacBook Pro started struggling right around the time the M1 chips hit the market. I'm not a conspiracy theorist and I'm not necessarily saying Apple did this on purpose that they crippled the Intel machines in one of the software updates, but we can't ignore the timing either. The M1 MacBook Pros come out and suddenly I'm seeing beach balls everywhere. Hmm. Anyway, these new chips are looking to bring all that power we've all been hoping for. So now the question is, which one should we get? And should you max out your machine? Recall the M1 iPad Pro. I had such high hopes for that. I spent a ton of money on the 16 gigabyte M1 iPad Pro, one terabyte of storage, but it turned out to be complete overkill iPadOS is still a bit of a Mickey Mouse operating system, and it most certainly doesn't make use of the amazing hardware on those M1 iPad Pros. However, I'm not afraid that this will happen with the new MacBook Pros because we already know the software will back it up. In fact, the tools I use on a daily basis, like Final Cut Pro, are what makes me wanna purchase a faster machine. So it's kind of the opposite of the M1 iPad Pro story. This isn't the case of buying a beast of a machine and then waiting for the software to catch up. This is actually a matter of using very powerful software that keeps demanding more powerful machines. The question for a lot of people is of course, do you need one of these machines or are you totally fine with a Mac mini or a MacBook Air? Because let's not forget, these machines are called MacBook Pro for a reason. And if we do need one of these machines, to what extent do we need to actually spec them out? Which machine is right for you? What do you need and what don't you need? Rather than just blindly tossing all your money at Apple and just maxing it all out. Well, to answer that, let's have a quick recap what each machine offers. Let's look at the design first, then we'll talk about the specs and some of the differences between these machines and try to figure out which one is the right one to buy. We have two new chips, the M1 Pro and the M1 Max. Now, can we just take a moment to talk about these names? What on earth were they smoking? Hey Tim, you know what would be funny? Let's call this one the M1 Pro MacBook Pro. Dude, what about this? The M1 Max MacBook Pro. Hey, what are you using? I'm using the M1 Max MacBook Pro. That's what I'm using. M1 Max MacBook Pro. I bet you can't say that five times in a row. Yeah, they must have had a good laugh. Anyway, for the design, it looks relatively similar to previous MacBooks. It's an aluminum housing, black keys, looks very sleek, just like we're used to from Apple but there are some very important changes. And of course, the most obvious one and the one most of us have been begging for for years is of course the return of the ports. Why Apple ever chose to get rid of them, we'll never know. Maybe it's because they needed the space and now that most components have shrunken down in size a little, they can afford to put them back. I don't know. The most important part is that all ports are here. We got some Thunderbolt ports, we have the MagSafe charging port, we finally have HDMI back, and for us creative types, finally, there is a dedicated SD card slot. And bringing back all those ports must have been a real mind shift for Apple. They've refused to give us the ports we wanted for years, and now they're back. So what does that mean for other devices? Will we finally get USB-C on the iPhone? I know most of you think that will never happen. Some of us think we will go portless, 
but in my opinion, it's way too early for that. But I have to say, when I heard that the MagSafe charger was coming back, I thought, oh, here we go again, another proprietary charger and port, typical Apple BS. But then they announced that we can actually still charge these MacBooks via USB-C as well. And this I really appreciate. It means you're not necessarily bound to yet another charger. And it also gives me hope for the future and potentially even for the iPhone. Apple also got rid of the touch bar and replaced it with actual function keys. And I, for one, am very happy about that. I type fast, but the way I type is kind of messed up. So I always have a couple fingers sticking out, which means I constantly hit the touch bar by accident. I also really didn't see the added value of it. It was just another fragile part of the laptop for me. I know some people really liked it. We were talking about it in our live stream yesterday with my man Alex from Alex Gear and Tech. He uses it for emojis and stuff. Yeah, the man loves his emojis. But yeah, I'm glad it's gone. The display is going to be one of the most amazing parts of this new MacBook. These new machines will get 120 hertz ProMotion Liquid Retina XDR displays with 1600 nits peak brightness. Now, you heard me complain about spending a lot of money on my overkill 16 gigs M1 iPad Pro, but the one thing that is absolutely stunning on this machine is the display. And now we're getting that same delicious crispy goodness on our MacBooks. I might even use it out of clamshell mode once in a while. And because it's pro motion, it's probably not going to hurt the battery life. But this new MacBook does have a notch. Yes, this is now the Notchbook Pro. Now, the bezels are very thin and I'm not too upset about having a bit of a notch, but I'm not quite sure why it has to be so big. I mean, it's not like we're getting Face ID. This is just for the camera module. Now, I do have a theory, which is pretty much the same theory I had about the notch on the iPhone 13, which is that it has become somewhat of a trademark for Apple and its true fanboys. True Apple fanboys want you to know they're using an Apple machine, and they want you to know that this is the last version. So to them, this notch might be even more valuable than the Apple logo or the Apple stickers for that matter. What's that about? Right, there's a notch, it's there, it's noticeable. Do I care? Not really. And I'm sure Apple will find ways to wrap the UI around the notch in a way that makes sense. Now, inside the notch, there is the new camera. And finally, Apple decided to give us 1080p. I will never understand why Apple kept putting these crappy cameras into our MacBooks. And even now, I think we should calm down with the praise. Apple patting themselves on the back for putting a 1080p camera in what is otherwise a state-of-the-art machine hardly deserves applause. I mean, they took out the potato camera and they gave us a nicer potato. Plenty of laptops out there that have 4K cameras built in, but hey, it's a start. The microphones and the speakers are also a lot better than the previous ones, which were already quite good. So if you look at the improved camera, the better speakers and the mics and the amazing crispy new display, these machines will be perfect mobile conferencing machines as well. Anyway, so there are almost no differences between the 14 inch model and the 16 inch model apart from the size. The difference is between the Pro and the Max chip. The M1 Pro chip has a 10 core CPU, eight high performance cores and two high efficiency cores and a 16 core GPU with up to 32 gigs of RAM. And this chip is set to deliver 70% faster CPU performance and double the GPU performance of the M1. The Max chip also delivers a 10 core CPU, but up to 32 cores of GPU and up to 64 gigs of memory. And you can spec out both models with internal storage of up to eight terabytes. Now with this updated display and all the huge improvements, I would have fully expected to take a bit of a hit in battery life, but that is not the case. In fact, the battery life is the most impressive it's ever been. And it's probably also the main distinguishing difference between the 14 inch and the 16 inch model beside the screen size, of course. The smaller MacBook Pro will have 14 hours of video playback, which is impressive, and the 16 inch will have 21 hours of video playback. That is just nuts. And with the new MagSafe charger, 30 minutes of charging will put you halfway back to a full battery. That's pretty damn impressive. So who are these MacBooks for and which one is right for us? Well, for me personally, I have a pretty good idea of what I need. I use my computer mainly for video editing on Final Cut Pro, and some of the plugins and processes I use are very labor intensive. So for me, it makes sense to opt for the best processing power and the fastest GPU I can get. 
Now, from experience with my 16-inch MacBook Pro, I know that I'm not a fan of the big form factor. It's a giant machine, it lives on my desk in clamshell mode most of the time, so I don't really care about the extra screen real estate. And when I do take it with me to travel, I actually prefer a smaller, more nimble machine. But back then, if you wanted the best, you had to get the 16-inch. With these new MacBooks, it's no longer like that. You can spec out both the 14-inch and the 16-inch pretty much the same way. So unless you absolutely need the extra screen real estate or the better battery life, the 14 inch is the way to go in my opinion. Will I spec it out completely? Because let's be honest, this is gonna be a big expense. I know it's my main professional work tool and I'm willing to invest in it, but I still try to cut costs wherever I can. So in my case, that means taking it easy on the internal storage. I don't need more than one terabyte. I never store any kind of video files, etc., on my internal storage. I edit straight off of my SSD drives. I'm currently using a Lassie rugged SSD. It's extremely fast and it has the added advantage of being able to use between all my devices. So that is where I will be saving some of my money. But having said all that, not everyone is a video creator or a content creator or a designer. So what do you need? I guess the first question should be, do you even need one of these machines? If you use your computer for office work and media consumption, both of these machines will be complete overkill. You'll be totally fine buying an M1 MacBook Pro or even a MacBook Air. If you do a lot of demanding work and you just never wanna to have to worry about your machine slowing down, you want that extra speed, the Pro will be more than enough more than you'll ever need. And if you are in that pro category, if you are one of those people that will actually utilize the extra power the Max version offers, you probably already know this and you've already decided to go for those highest end specs. So guys, my advice would be to think hard about what you really need versus what you think you need and make your purchasing decision based on that. But you know, if you have the cash to throw around and you just want the fastest shiny new machine, why not? It's your party. Guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give it one of these. It really does help the channel. Subscribe for more content. Thank you so much for watching and see you in the next one.